Martial arts was a self-medicating thing for me. Because if I didn't have it, he said, you would have been much worse. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Episode 11 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host and the founder of Whistlekick, makers of the world's best sparring gear and some other great stuff. If you're new to the show, you can learn more about Whistlekick at whistlekick.com, and you can learn more about this podcast at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We're going to try something new here on the show, and that's offering discounts to our listeners. As a thank you for being an early listener to the show, we're going to give you 30% off any purchase at whistlekick.com. Just use the coupon code PODCAST1. That's PODCAST and the number one at checkout. And that code's good through the end of June. But enough about that. On today's show, we have Doshu Alan Viernes, a martial artist from Maine and the grandmaster of Jukadu, a blended style his mother pioneered decades ago. Though my main roots overlap a bit with Doshu Allen's, I didn't know much about him until this episode. Our talk was absolutely full of insights and incredible honesty. I came away feeling very positive and motivated to train harder. I hope it means just as much for you. So here we go. Doshu, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thank you for having me. It's it, uh, it's an honor to have you. I'm, I'm looking forward to it because I'm going to learn a lot about you. I know who you are. Of course, we've we roll in the same circles, but haven't really had much chance to get to know you or talk to you. So I'm going to be learning right along with the listeners. So that's that's going to be great. Sounds good. So let's jump right in. Why don't you start by telling us a bit about how you got started with the martial arts and and where that was and, and all that. Sure. In fact, I uh, started martial arts back in 1964. I was five years old. I was training in an Aikido dojo in Waipahu, Hawaii. Um, my instructor at that time was Rokudan Philippi Kanoi. Uh, the reason my parents put me into martial arts back then is I was a severe stutterer. Um, I couldn't focus in school. I couldn't stay still. I was the kid that was always moving around or playing. <laughs> and that's that's one of the um, main reasons I, I started out in martial arts. Those are... Great reasons. Yes. Uh, so you've clearly stuck with it. Yes. And, and you have yes. your own school now. So um, tell us a little bit about that journey. How did you get from from then to to now? Sure. Um, when when I started out in Aikido, my mom at the same time was taking martial arts. Um, she um, martial art runs in our family. She had plans back then of op- um, um, formulating her own style. So she wanted to keep me busy. Uh, I stayed with Aikido for 12 years. I actually rose to the rank of Nidan. And she started Jukudu, which is the art that I'm in right now, back in 1972. So I've been um, in Jukudu ever since its inception. My mom retired back in March of 1996, and I officially became... um, the grandmaster of Jukudu and and but we use the term doshu because doshu is a Japanese um, term and it means hereditary grandmaster um, and so you'll hear my students calling me doshu uh, currently I am the grandmaster of Jukudu I run the Jukudu organization we are a very young organization but on the same token is I I you know I tell people I said you know, Jukudu is made up of Kung Fu, Karate, Aikido, and Judo. And everyone have heard of those other styles. I, I like to refer to Jukudu as a toss salad. Um, when, when you eat a salad and you have the different vegetables, um, this is what Jukudu is like. Um, you know, at, at, at times you'll taste a tomato or a cucumber or lettuce. And uh, what my mom has done, she studied in all four she picked out the techniques from each one that she felt would be best suited for Jukudu. And this is what we have, the, the art of Jukudu. Cool. Yeah, I, I like that salad analogy. That's kind of neat. I haven't, you know, I've talked with people that are in blended styles before, right. and I was fortunate enough to, to grow up in a dojo that uh, was very o- open and welcoming of other elements from other styles. Sure. But that, that analogy is perfect. <laughs> Well, I think that gives us a pretty good picture of where you're coming from. Yeah. And so you've been around. You've got great stories, I'm sure. And I'd love to hear your 
best martial arts story? Well, you know, I, I, um, I've been thinking of that. I mean, I, I have so many martial arts stories, but if, if I had to, you know, um, pick one, I'm, I'm going to pick the one that, um, I traveled to, uh, hung, uh, no, I'm not hungry, but I, in fact, I, I traveled to Italy, part of a, uh, pride of America martial arts tournament. Um, this was back in 1997 um, the venue was an outdoor, almost like a three-ring circus tent. And if you could imagine what a three-ring circus tent looks like, it's a big, big tent. Yeah. It was very professional. Um, and the reason I bring up this, because at that particular event, it was, you know, there was competitors from, of course, the USA, uh, Canada, Australia, Hungary, uh, Germany, um, Italy, of course. And... It was a very, you know, fill week. Um, we were doing competition, and then on that Friday night, we had a break, and then the next morning, all of the first place winners were supposed to compete for, like, the Grand Championship Award, like most tournaments do. Mm-hmm. Well, they had a professional cleaning company that would come in nightly and clean up the uh the three ring you know or 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 the tent well what they did is they collected all of the results and didn't realize that it was something that needed to be kept and they threw it away oh no so saturday morning um i was one also one of the judges i also competed at it we were looking for the results now this is already 3 days of event and all of the results are gone <sighs> And so you have martial artists from different countries working together as a team, realizing that we're in big trouble right now. (laughs) Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, from searching the tents, from searching uh, the trash cans, and finally, we decided to check the dumpsters. (laughs) There's dumpsters out there, and we found the results all in a bag in a dumpster. This is after like two hours of looking. Um, you know, I, I, I look at that and, and I think back like, wow, you know, I mean, we would have to do the tournament again. Um, yeah. And especially when you have a conflict of, you know, languages, if, if you know what I'm saying. Sure. But we all work together as a team, and, and, and that's what martial arts should be. We work together as a team. We found that after that competition, we all sat down, had a good beer, and, and you know, um, I thought that was a a, a neat, uh, you know, um, scenario or situation, and but it it all turned out well for everyone. Yeah, that's pretty unique. I've heard of, I thought pretty much anything and everything happening at a tournament before, but I yes. can't say I've ever heard of the <laughs> results being thrown away. <laughs> yes. Uh, wow. Yeah. That that. As, as you were telling it, I, I was feeling my anxiety level rise of what, what do you do if you can't find them? So, right. Uh, it's a good thing you didn't have to f- figure that out. Right. So you started martial arts quite young, and it's clearly been a huge part of your life. Um, and, and now, you know, maybe even as the biggest pillar of your life at this point. Sure. But I'd like you to think about how the martial arts has impacted who you are, who Doshu is as a person. And tell us a little bit about some of those benefits. You you mentioned that your your mother had put you in the martial arts when you were young because you had trouble focusing and you, you were a stutterer. So tell us a little bit about that and how you've improved as a person through martial arts. Well, I mean, you know, as a stutterer, okay, the, the one thing that I can remember from, you know, age five, kindergarten, you know, your first grade, your second grade, is that I could never at that time in, in my life stand in front of my class and read a simple sentence like the dog ran after the ball. Um, I was on a scale of one to 10, a 10 in terms of being a stutterer. Um, And I look back and I remember, you know, kids would laugh because, you know, it sounds funny if, if you ever hear someone stuttering. I mean, if, but you know, that did affect me back then as a child. And the one thing that martial arts did, and in this case, um, 
I grew up in a Japanese speaking dojo where English was 5% and Japanese was 95%. And most people today might look at that and think, wow, that's a setup for failure. But you know, that's the best thing that could have happened because it leveled the playing field, meaning I had to really focus now. Hmm. And the one thing about being in a dojo, and I, I think you can equate to this, is that you know, when you get in a dojo, everybody is equal. And, you know, back then, um, you know, there wasn't any books on how to help a stutterer. Or well, back then, there wasn't even the term ADD, ADHD. If they had that back then, I, I probably would have had it. But what sure. they did is with, you know, pure traditional martial art training, I had to, you know, learn these things. I had to eventually learn how to sit still, stand still, or, you know, or learn the techniques and, and, and when they called your name, you had to answer. And someone who's a stutterer realize it. There's a couple seconds, like if your name is called, there's a couple seconds before you can actually say here. Hmm. And when they do that time after time, class after class, um, that helped me overcome. And today I can stand in front of a group of people. I can, you know, um, another thing that really helped too, and, and I'm just going to kind of interject this, is that, when I graduated from high school back in 1977, um, I went into the military. Um, and the military and martial arts to me was so alike, um, you know. And, you know, I originally went in for a three-year term, but uh, tour, I should say, but ended up staying for 15 years, took an early retirement back in 1992. Um, mm. So, you know, martial arts has really helped me, helped me in terms of, um, you know, sticking to my goals, um, you know, and believing in, in, in yourself, first of all, giving you the confidence. Um, and, but there's a difference between confidence and overconfidence. Um, you know, cause some of the things I did in the army, um, some of the training I probably would have never done if I did not have martial arts. Um, you know, I grew up in the combat arms environment. Um, I jumped out of airplanes, repelled out of helicopters. I went to jung uh, you know, jungle school. I was a U.S. Army Ranger. I went to Ranger School. And, you know, I have all of these certificates, and, and I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but all of those was only possible because someone back then in that dojo believed in me and gave me the chance. Now, it wasn't easy at first because I was doing a lot of push-ups, <laughs> and uh, a lot of exercises, a lot of cleaning the dojo because I was the one always playing around. I was the one, and I think I was playing around because that was my way of covering up my stuttering now that I look back. Um, mm. But, you know, it, it has helped me. It, it has helped me tremendously. Um, you know, and again, going into the Army, the Army was like being in martial arts. I mean, a lot of the elements are so alike. Um, so, you know, it, it's helped me, it's helped me till now. Um, you know, when I got out of the army, I got my honorable discharge back in 1992 and I immediately opened up my martial arts school. And, uh, so my school has been here in Maine since 1992. So, you know, 23 years, um, the economy kind of tanked, uh, several years ago. And, um, you know, being a martial arts school owner um, was a really tough thing. Um, now, when I became grandmaster, you know, I had several goals. Um, and, and one of the goals was to own my own building. I needed a permanent home for Jukadu, and that's where I'm at today. I, I was able to complete that, you know, three years ago, purchased this building, and now we have a permanent home. <laughs> that's wonderful. Yes. Cool. That's that's quite the journey, and, and um, I think there was a lot to take away from that, and I hope the listeners really, you know, this might even be a good section of the interview to go back and listen to again, because you had a lot of really good stuff in there. Right. So I'd like to kind of switch gears. You know, we yep. talked a lot about the positives for you, and yep. now we're going to go kind of to the other end. I'd like you to think about a negative, a, a rough patch in your life, and tell us how the martial arts or your martial arts training, or however you want to answer it, sure, helped you move through that or overcome it? Well, you know, 
Um, first of all, the, the, the rough patch was, um, well, at, at first when I started because of, you know, being that kid who was a severe stutterer, couldn't focus. But then I'm going to kind of fast forward. Um, I'm, I'm going to go when I enlisted in the Army. Um, when I enlisted in the Army in 1977, I, you know, you go to basic training, you go to advanced infantry training, or uh, individual training, and then I um, went to Korea. I was stationed in, in the Republic of Korea from 1978 to 79. Well, during one of our live fire training exercise, an unfortunate situation happened, and now I can speak of it freely. Um, but you know, years ago, I, I didn't realize what was happening. Um, I was a member of a crew, and four of us um, got swept underwater um, in the middle of the monsoon season. And if mm. you know anything about Korea in the monsoon season, the the, the water uh, level in the river. Um, you know, 30, 40 feet difference. Wow. Um, all of my crew members died except me. Mm-hmm. Um, and when when I say we got sucked underwater, looking at the reports now, you know, anywhere from 50 to 80 feet underwater. And, you know, <laughs> I was, what I did when I got sucked underwater, now that I can, you know, I remained calm. I took it, you know, I remained calm. I went into some kind of a trance. They said when when I came up um, downstream, you know, it was like five, six, seven minutes underwater. Now, when that situation happened, um, I went to the Army Hospital in Seoul, Korea for overnight observation. And after that, they never saw me again, meaning, you know, I was back in my unit. And years went by and... I started realizing that every time I near water, I would, you know, like if I was driving over a bridge, I would hold my, my steering wheel so tight. My heart would beat faster. Um, if I would take a shower and close my eyes, I would have little, you know, spots of, um, you know, I guess you can call it blackout, you know what I'm saying? And, um, I, I never thought much of it. You know, I was in the combat arms and, um, when you're in the infantry or, you know, airborne and all that stuff, you know, it was a lot of no pain, no gain, um, you know, and, you know, so I, I, I never thought about, you know, telling anyone about it until um, when I got out of the army, I out process and I went through a series of, you know, testing that they do for all of, you know, service member leaving and it was found out that I had PTSD from that situation. Sure. And the doctor was kind of surprised that um, they said that PTSD can really, you know, knock a soldier down. And when he found out I was in martial arts, he said that that's the key. Martial arts was a self-medicating thing for me. Because if I didn't have it, he said, you would have been much worse. Um, because it caused me to get in front of people. It caused me not to hide in the corner. It caused me, you know, to, to, I mean, be the leader that I am. And so, you know, I, I can thank the martial arts um, because I have other friends that have PTSD and you can see the, um, you know, the, the, I guess you can say the difference, um, and so in terms of a low point, I mean, that was a low point, but at the same time, martial arts really helped me overcome that. Um, yes, I still go to, I guess you can say counseling. Um, you know, at first I was embarrassed about saying counseling and stuff like that, but now I look at it and say, you know, um, it's it's something that, you know, any of the veterans that have PTSD, that's, you know, something that we need to do. And and for me to be able to talk about it now, um, it's evident that, you know, um, with, with martial arts and counseling, it's helped me kind of overcome that. Wow, that's that's quite the story, and I appreciate you sharing it. Your your honesty uh, certainly came through, and, and I kind of felt like I was there with you. There were a couple of points you were talking about being underwater. I, I noticed I was sort of holding my breath. Yes. Um, so that that's... Wow, I, I don't know what else to say. Wow is really the only word I think that yeah, it's, uh, suffices. E- even though that happened way back, you know, like I said, seventy-eight. Um, um, 
it's still fresh in my mind. You know, it's still fresh. It's like, God, you know, you would think that I would forget it after these years, but it's still fresh in my mind. And I only wish that those other, you know, members of the team would have made it. Um, it was one Korean soldier and two other American soldiers. And we were all friends. And, um, you know, it, it, it's an unfortunate situation. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Maybe kind of fitting that we're recording this just a couple days after Memorial Day. Yes. Not that we planned it in this way. I certainly didn't know this no, story no, when, that's, when that's we started not a talking. But um, yeah, it, it's thank you, thank you for for sharing that. Certainly. Nope. Um, so let's pull it back a little sure. bit. Uh, maybe we can we can go back to the the happier yeah side. Think about the people that you've had in your life that have been instrumental in, in your martial arts upbringing, in your career. Yeah. And let's take out your instructors. Yeah. And who kind of rises to the top as the, the one that was the most influential? Well, that was no problems. Um, <clears throat> hands down, it's my grandma. <laughs> um, unfortunately, my mom and dad divorced when I was pretty young. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, I ended up living with my grandma <clears throat> and when I was going to, you know, the dojo, you know, living in Hawaii, um, you know, picture the setting, it's 80 degrees year round, um, nice ocean breeze, the beach is always inviting, surf is always up, you know, and yeah. anytime I had classes, um, there was always a friend or friends that were heading to the beach and they would always ask me if I wanted to go, and I would always ask my grandma, you know, if I could, instead of going to the dojo, can I go to classes? And my grandma from day one was always saying, no, you must go to the dojo, and when it's when you're done your classes, the beach will always be there. And I remember her telling me this, and I mm. tried and tried and tried. But, you know, I look now, and I look back, and I think, Wow. My, if my grandma would have let me go to the beach one time, then it would have been a second time, third time. And it wasn't the the problem of going to the beach or the issue of going to the beach. It was the issue of whenever there was classes at the dojo, something else came up. But my grandma yeah. made sure that I went to classes. And, you know, I, I don't care who we are. If you want to learn, one of the best places to do it is hands-on in the dojo. And, and, you know, without that right there, I, I would not have been the person I am today. I probably would have not gotten the benefit um, of, you know, my grandma ensuring that I was dedicated and teaching me what commitment was. Uh, you know, because today um, I see a lot of kids that are so involved in so many things and they love the dojo, but then the dojo is always put to the back burner. And, and they don't get the full benefit of, of what the dojo is about. And, and, you know, so my grandma, I mean, there's no doubt in my mind. <laughs> cool. Yeah. She, uh, wish, did she live long enough to see that you, you made martial arts such a big part of your life? Yes. In fact, um, she was able to, uh, come and visit, the dojo back in 1996. Uh, oh, wow. She actually came up from Hawaii, and um, and this is after I became grandmaster. Um, and of course, the dojo was at the very early stages, but you know she was able to you know see that, and and you know uh, it's. I wish she was still around because she was um, she was really really ahead of her time. Hmm. <laughs> Great. It's nice. You know, I think for just about everyone that that starts young and continues through the martial arts, that they hit a point where they need somebody in their life. And it's it's almost always a family member to kind of push them through. I was lucky enough to have that in my mother and you certainly had that with your grandmother. So that's great. Yes. So let's talk about competition a bit. Have you done any martial arts competition? Well, yes. Um, 
and and again, you mentioned um, the trip to Italy. Yes, in fact, well, you know, even before that, uh, when I was in the army, I competed uh, full contact in Europe. Um, we had a a team called the Army Karate Team, and the Army Karate Team, um, like if you go to Europe, there's an Army Karate Team. If you go to Asia, there's an Army Karate Team. So there's different segments. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. so the army karate team that we had was, uh, out of Germany and we had like a 12 member team, all different martial arts, uh, styles. And, and, you know, we were all black belts and I fought, uh, full contact. And when I say full contact, it was, um, probably as close as you can get to Kyoshin karate, which is the hmm. bare knuckle fighting yeah. Um, and, and that's what I did for three years. Um, and then when I left the army, um, I had a choice. Would I open up a full contact school or would I go to a more traditional setting? And I really thought about this. And, and at that point I said, you know what? I want to go through a traditional setting. And so that's what I did. I kind of change over. Um, and I did compete, um, you know, in your regular Epon tournaments. Um, you know, I went to Italy, I went to Hungary, and, and I went to a couple other, I guess you can say, so-called world championships. And, and I had fun. I mean, uh, you know, the first several years in Epon, um, when I first came on to Epon, I competed quite a bit. Um, to include judging and, you know, as, as I got older, it started taking a toll. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but the thing is, is I, I, I did, I competed because I wanted my students to see that whether I won or lost, that I could go out there and do it honorably. And, you know, it's tough because, you know, here I am a grandmaster and nobody wants to think of a grandmaster not winning. Uh, but on the same token is that, you know, it's up to the judges and, and, as long as I know I went in there, did my best, and, and you know, I was happy with that. Sure. Yeah, that's a, it's a wonderful um, lesson to share yes. with your students, and it's something that I've heard a number of times from a number of masters that the primary reason they compete is to teach their students lesson or to inspire them yes. to work a little harder or something. Um, and for listeners that may not be local to the New England area, uh, the Epon tournaments that um, Doshu was speaking of, it's it, uh, it's, an, it's a circuit. It's a New England circuit, and uh, um, I'll have a link to that in the show notes if anybody wants to look up a little bit more information on them. So you've already trained with a, a bunch of different people, great people all over the world, but if you could train with anybody, uh, be they living or dead, who would that be and why? Well, number one would be Bruce Lee. Okay. And why? Because Bruce Lee was, he was the person that really, um, well, <clears throat> let's take a step back. Years ago, when an American would, say, take martial arts, regardless of what style, what instructor, a lot of times he, he or she wasn't shown all of the techniques. Um they would only show so much. Uh, Bruce Lee was the number one individual who said, yeah, you know what, when I teach someone, I'm going to teach them everything that I know. And I really like that. I mean, his attitude or his, uh, uh, you know, um, belief in this did cause people to resent him, but he stood his ground and, you know, the way I look at it, if, if you're going to teach martial arts, um, and especially if someone wants to move up the ranks and earn a black belt, they're definitely going to have to learn everything. And, and that's, that's one of my, you know, um, main reasons. And of course he was also a, um, also martial artist himself. Mm. And I think there's some parallels to be drawn between Jeet Kune Do and, and Jukudu. Would, would you agree? The the yes um, pulling together of different styles. Yes, it is. Yes. Was there any was there any inspiration early on? Was that did that play into any of your your mother's decisions as she was forming the style? Yep it 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 definitely has. I mean you know and and um 
I, I I know it has because you know Bruce Lee was was a very prominent figure, especially growing up. I mean, he still is today, but I don't think a lot of the younger martial artists realize that. Um, you know, as much as when when we were growing up. But yes, um, I I know that affected. You know, the the choices that my mom made in reference to Jukadu. Interesting. That's really cool. Yeah, there are a lot of people today, you know, the kids kind of coming up, even if they're coming up in martial arts that don't seem to know who Bruce Lee is. So when, when Whistlekick goes to events, we'll often play old Bruce Lee films. And it's funny, the kids will come up and say, you know, is that, is that Jackie Chan? Is that Jet Li? Yes, um, yes. You know, they don't, they don't know who he is. So it's kind of a, a, a bit of a personal mission to spread Bruce Lee to the younger generation. Um, he, here's a great transition. So he was clearly a, a wonderful martial arts uh, yes. practitioner as well as an actor. Yes. Do you have a favorite martial arts movie, be it from Bruce Lee or someone else? Well, I, um, I actually really love the karate kid. Um, which one? What the, 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 the original or the, yes, or the remake, the, the original karate kid. Um, I really, really love that because I use that a lot in our teachings, um, or, mm. In, in making, you know, examples or references. Because, um, you know, in the original Karate Kid, you had the school that, you know, all the fighters came from. And then you had Mr. Miyagi. Um, and, you know, you look at him, he's humble, and it looks like he couldn't hurt a fly. <laughs> and, and you know, so I, I use it in, in reference, you know, like, like when I do school talks, um, I, I meet with teachers or I, I um, you know, talking to parents, I said, this is the dojo that Mr. Miyagi comes from. Um, we're not here to use Jukudu inappropriately. We're not you, you know, and, and cause sometimes my kids will come uh, from school and say, you know, this kid said that their style is better and this and that. And I said, listen, I said, that's okay. It's not hurting us. You know, I said, if you want to, um, be proud of your style, then put the effort to it, you know? Um, and, and so I, I, I really use that a lot because that's, that's a really, um, you know, it, it, it applies to today. Um, you know, so I, I, uh, just love the, the, the karate kid. I always recommend them going to, to, to watch it because, the, the the lessons that that it shows you, you know, it, it again it it applies to to what is happening today. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. It, it's one of my favorite films as well. Is there a, a favorite actor, favorite martial arts actor? Um, Jean Claude Van Damme. <laughs> um, yeah, he's uh, pretty inspiring. I mean, you know, from his his uh, physical fitness and, you know, he's, he's, I don't know. He, he just has it all. <laughs> I was surprised. I was just reading something this morning. He's still making movies. There's another movie coming out this year. Yes. Of course, his films aren't quite as, as prominent as they were right. uh, in the late eighties and early nineties, but he's been making movies for quite a long time. Right. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah. It's uh it's amazing. He's still doing it. And then his, his famous splits, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I'm trying, I don't even remember what it was for, but there was the TV commercial last year with him doing the split between the two semi trucks. Yes. And then, and then as a counter to that, Chuck Norris did, um, the, the one with the airplanes. <laughs> right. <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was neat. That was neat. How about books? Are you are you a reader? Any? Well, you know, um, I have read books. Um, one book that kind of stands at the Book of Five Rings. Mm. Um, I I really like that. I actually have it a book on tape because, again, it really relates to life. There's there's you know, it, I I think it's a good thing for a martial artist to, um, you know, listen to. The reason I have it on on um, tape is that being that you know, we, we travel to tournaments could be half hour tournament could be a three, four, five hour tournament. Yeah. And, and I like to reflect back and it kind of keeps me grounded. 
um, it, it, it bring me, brings me back to my root and, and makes me, you know, not, not forget, you know, there, there's so many good sayings. There's, there's so many phrases that, that, um, it's amazing. This is someone that was back, you know, way before our time and how their, their teachings apply to us today. Yeah. It's, you know, that, that book is one that's come up through several interviews and it's one that I have to admit I haven't read yet. Yes. So it's, um, it's on my list. I'm going to get there soon. Yeah. <laughs> so you've clearly already accomplished quite a bit through your martial arts career. I mean, you, you've had the kind of martial arts life that I think most anyone would be not just proud of, but deeply honored to have. But do you have any further goals, anything that you're, you're working towards? Yes, I do. Um, well, well, when I became Grandmaster, I had three goals set on, um, and, and I wrote it down, and I placed it next to my nightstand so I could see it. I could see it and see it. Um, number one was um, to promote Jukudu uh, locally and globally, and meaning by, by going to different martial art events throughout the world. So I, I, I've been doing that, and that's going to be a, a, you know, a continually – ongoing goal. Uh, number two was to get a permanent location um, because, you know, then I can set my roots down. Um, so we, my sure. wife and I were fortunate to be able to buy this uh, building that we're at. Um, it's two floors of 5,000 square feet on each floor. Wow. Uh, but, you know, when you buy a pre-existing building, you go with the setup that's there. I wish I could uh, just design it myself, but you know what? Um, what can you say? You know what I mean? Um, and, and that's one thing about martial arts. It, it kind of teaches you how to, uh, you know, adapt to the situation. And we're, um, we just, you know, made some major renovations uh, back in April. Uh, and someday I have to invite you down so, so you can kind of see my, my, my space, I guess you can say. Oh, that, would, that would be great. But the one goal that I am um, getting ready to embark on is to write a book on Jukadu. Um, and it's because cause it's important. I mean, you know, I am the second grandmaster in the lineage of Jukadu. My mom is the founder of Jukadu. And so my goal is to uh, write a book, especially while my mom is still alive. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and I, I, I think it will be good for the, for our art. I mean, we are a very young art, but on the same token is that, you know, every good thing has to have a start, you know, and, and, um, you know, so like, you know, Jukadu was established in 1972, um, just like Coke, 1972, <laughs> just, <laughs> just like, um, uh, the price is right. The price is right. 97, all good stuff here. You know what I mean? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, um, my my goal now is to write a book on Jukadu, and I actually have a good friend who's an author, and she is going to be guiding me along. And it, it's it's probably going to be like a one to two year um, time frame, but that's that's my goal right there. I think that's great. You know, one of the things growing up in karate, you know, none of the founders of of any of the the ancient arts really put anything down in writing. And then as I moved to Vermont, I started training in Taekwondo. And of course, Taekwondo was a younger art and, and the founder not only wrote some things down, he, he wrote quite a bit down. Yes. And it's been really interesting to see how that has affected the, the art. It's kept some things much truer to what his vision was. And, you know, if that's at all one of your goals, I think writing a book would serve very well towards making sure the, the, the founding principles weren't just passed down, but you right. know, straight from the horse's mouth. Well, um, not to interject, but, um, one of the other things that I did for Jukadu, um, and this is, uh, has a result of being in the army, you know, uh, I have seen a lot of styles with great instructors and, and for some unfortunate reason, they pass away, and there is no guidelines like who takes over. Um, yeah. 
And I've seen dojos rip apart because you have people say, no, I'm in charge. I'm in charge. You know what I'm saying? And right. so I came up with an official Jukadu chain of command in the event of my, you know, debt. And, and I, you know, the Jukadu chain of command will take over. And so that our style for whatever we have, you know, it's not going to cause people to fight each other and see like, who's in charge, who's this, who's that. Uh, so I have an official Jukadu chain of command for, for the sole purpose of that. Um, and you know, cause I've, I've seen too many situations happen. Um, and I got to thank the military for that. Uh, cause you know, this has caused me to, you know, it's like having a will, you know, something happens, exactly. you don't have that will, then you leave everything up to the state. Um, you know, and, and so I, uh, I'm, I'm really happy that I have the Jukadu chain of command because, you know, their their job or the job of the Jukadu chain of command is to carry Jukadu on to the next uh, century. I think that's a fantastic idea, and it's one that hopefully uh, school owners and, and grandmasters will put into place after hearing this. It's not something any of us want to talk about. Right. Uh, I, I came from working in IT for many, many years, and of course, in, in technology, having things documented is important because if yes. you're the only one with the passwords yes. and you get hit by a truck, right? everyone's in alert. And, and this is um, maybe a little less concrete, but I'd say even more important. Yes. it's uh, and, and, you know, nobody wants to think about the unfortunate, but, you know, life is too precious here. <laughs> And yeah. things can change in a moment, and you know, um, you know, it's it's the same as having insurance. You you hope you never have to use that insurance, but you know, something ever happens, you have it. Well, uh, just one final question for you. Um, I mean, not that you haven't shared a tremendous amount of of wonderful advice already, but do you have any parting words for the people listening? Yeah. Um, Basically, especially to the parents, I mean, you know, um, if your child is in martial arts, um, you know, I understand that there is so many sports um, that our kids are involved in. But one of the things that martial arts is going to teach them is that time management. Um, you know, I have a lot of kids playing sports and I tell them, I said, you know, or I tell the parents that if they can come to that one class a week that that keeps the connection to the dojo and believe it or not it's going to teach them that time management so that when they're off into college and they have a number of things to do without mom and dad hovering over them that's where martial art training is going to kick in mm -hmm. um so you know that's that 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 is my advice of course i have so much more advice but but on the same token is that um the one thing I want to leave it with is that kids don't quit martial arts. Parents quit. Once the parents quit, then the kids will quit. Mm. And and I know, you know, and I'm not here to, I know some people might, I'm, but that's, the, you know, a five-year-old doesn't quit. It's the parents right. that quit. And once the parents feel that, well, it's, you know, they're not going to go, then yes, the kids will follow through. That, that's wonderful advice. Yeah, I, I've never thought of it in that way, but yep. you're absolutely right. But um, you know, again, you know, it's uh, I love martial arts. I love that we have so many different styles. Um, I love the tournaments. I you know I love working with the kids. Um, you know, it, it's I I I wouldn't change anything. <laughs> cool. Well, now it's your turn to kind of tell us what's going on. You know, if somebody wants to, to get a hold of you or yep. or is interested in, in what you've got going on, how yep. would they get a hold well, of you? Well, two things. If someone is interested in finding out more about Jukadu, we do have a Jukadu website. It's uh, www.jukadousa.com. I, I also have the 19th annual friendship tournament coming up on June 20th. Um, this is a EPON rated event that will be held in Gorham, Maine at the University of Southern Maine, uh, the sports center. Uh, this mm -hmm. is a all styles 
all ranked martial arts tournament. Um, and if, if someone would like to, you know, you know, try something different, um, come on down. Um, we're, we're a couple weeks away. If you need information, um, you know, you can always call 207-854-9408 and ask for me, uh, Doshu Allen or Allen. Okay, great. And, uh, so this episode actually will get released before your tournament. Okay. Uh, we usually have a couple of weeks of lead time, but uh, we're recording this early enough that we can get that out. So that's great. And uh, we'll have links to all that stuff and uh, anything else that you and I may talk about once we stop the interview in the show notes on, on the website, of course, at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Okay. So, yeah, this has been great. I really uh, appreciate your time, Doshu. And thank you for being here on, on Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thank you for having me, Jeremy. Thanks for listening to this episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. See what I mean about the honesty? Thank you to Doshu Allen for coming on and sharing so much with us. Please be sure to subscribe to the show so you never miss one of the great weekly episodes. If you like the show, I'd really appreciate a five-star review on Stitcher, iTunes, or wherever it is you download your podcasts. These reviews help us grow quite a bit. You can check out the show notes with links to all the books, movies, and more that we talked about, and those notes are over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're there... If you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a wonderful interview, please do fill out the guest form. And of course, if you'd like to learn more about the great products we make at Whistlekick, please check us out at whistlekick.com. And don't forget that coupon code for 30% off, PODCAST1. And that's only good through the end of June. Train hard, smile, and have a great day.